you'd like to stand with me to honor the Word of God, those of you that can. Scripture lessons taken from the book of Genesis chapter 4, verses 8 and 10, then James chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. This is taken from the NRSV Bible. Cain said to his brother Abel, let us go out to the field. And when they were in the field, Christ rose up against, not Christ, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. Then in James chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, James says, If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill. And yet you do not supply their bodily needs. What is the good of that? Lord, thank you this morning for your word. Thank you this morning, Lord, for the wonderful hymns and songs we've heard. Now, Lord, open our hearts and our ears that we understand what you're saying to us this morning. In Christ's name, I ask a blessing upon us all. Amen. Before you're seated, turn around, shake somebody's hand, and tell them, love lifted me. If you follow the Genesis narrative, especially what I read for you this morning, we find that in chapters 1 and 2, it speaks about how God is eternal, and then it speaks, of course, about how God has created all things. He has created all humans in the image of God, meaning that we have the capacity to know God and to be in a relationship with God and to share in the creativity and love of God. I believe that's God's intention. We find early on that God walked with Adam and Eve and sought them out daily. But then, of course, when we turn to chapter 3, it gives us the problem of sin. As Paul would say in Romans 5 and 12, through one man, Adam, sin entered the world and death through sin. And so death has spread to everyone because all of sin. This speaks to the fact that we turn from God and we go our own way. And so we alienate ourselves from God and then we alienate ourselves and get ourselves into all sorts of trouble. Then we get to chapter 4, which I read for you just a few moments ago. It describes what happens to humans as we continue in sin. I'm not going to dwell on all the details of like who shot John and why in the story of Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. Having a trouble with those two this morning. I'm not going to get into all the details of that. You've probably heard that many times and there's a lot of questions you can't answer. But what I'm going to focus on this morning is just simply the question asked of God by Cain and Cain's response. The question God asked was, where is your brother Abel? Cain's response was, how should I know? Am I his babysitter? God's response was, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And then we can go on and on into the story that finally when God reveals to Cain all that had happened. Cain cries out like many would, oh, my punishment is greater than I can bear. What a wuss. If you try to read this story literally, you will miss the big picture about Cain and Abel. They weren't just two silly brothers who lived a long time ago. Cain and Abel represents everybody. This is the story of the whole human race, a story of people who fall into envy and hatred and violence and fear. It's a story that keeps repeating itself over and over in every generation. I don't know about you, but I checked the morning newspapers and the, and the headlines, and I saw murder, 
I saw shootings. I saw all types of mayhem. So it tells us that what happened in with Cain and Abel is still among us. And then I have mentioned in many times, in various ways, that Jesus asked the same questions. I told you that the Sermon on the Mount was a game changer. How many of you believe that? It's a game changer. It's a game changer because the Jews had never heard a rabbi or any religious person ever, ever speak the way Jesus spoke. You can read it in Luke 6, which is another variation of the Sermon on the Mount. We often go to Matthew, but Luke has it as well. Luke 20, uh, 6, 27 says, But I say unto to you that listen, love your enemies. You know, I don't think that has really sunk down into our hearts yet the way it should. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other one also. If anyone takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Now anyone listening to those words, and I'm sure he said them many times in many places, would have been, shake, would have been shaken to their core. Because I believe God still wants to shake all of us to our core. He wants to challenge our preconceived ideas, our prejudices, and all the, the things that we have inside of us as humans. We need to remember that God's way is way above us. Amen? Way above us. Isaiah says it the best in 55 and 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, <clears throat> nor are your ways my ways says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. See, we often tend to think of God in human terms, but God has already said, I'm beyond you. I don't think like you do. One thing that we know God thinks of is part of our banner, and the top number one is God thinks in love. As a matter of fact, John says, God is love. Now we know he shows love, but he embodies love, and that's hard for us to wrap our mind around, isn't it? It's hard. We can never outsmart or outthink God. The Corinthian writer reminds us of that in, in 319, for the wisdom of this world, and we've got a lot of people in this world who really think they're smart. But here's what he says, The wisdom of the world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, and they are futile. You can go to what the proverb writer writes about the ants and how they go forth as a band of armies, but yet have no king. Now figure that one out. That's a good one. I pondered that a lot. That's a good one. I cannot think, of course any better parable, and I know I get repetitive sometimes, but when we look at the parable of the Good Samaritan, the background of that is they were talking about the greatest commandments, and of course the greatest commandment is what? Love God. And the second commandment is like to that, love each other, right, as we love ourselves. Jesus was teaching that that day. But there was a lawyer of the law who heard that. And he had heard it go in, and, and, and literally it went in one ear and out the other, and he went, yeah, 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 I heard all that before. But then he gets to the question that he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Brings it right down. And I found out a long time ago, don't ask God a question if you don't want the answer. Because God's going to give you the answer, and you may not like the answer. And, of course, from that, we get the parable, and I'm not going to go through it today, but we get the parable of the Good Samaritan. How many of us know the parable of the Good Samaritan? We can probably put all the pieces together. But what I want you to focus on 
is that in that parable, we have the embodiment of someone who says, yes, I am my brother's keeper. We find that perhaps two who should have at least thought about being their brother's keeper was the priest and the Levite. Why they didn't stop, I don't know. Probably the best reason I could think of is if they were on their way to the temple, if you touched a dead body, you were considered defiled and they wouldn't be able to officiate. Then on the other hand, what's the highest calling? I'll leave that to you. Nevertheless, they did not intervene. But let's bring this down to today. As I said a few weeks ago, John reminds us, love is not talk. Love is action. John 3.16, I know we've heard it. I probably heard it in Sunday school. Don't remember the first time I've heard it, but we can all quote it, can't we? That for God so loved the world, he gave. He did something about it. He did something about the creation that he created, that we go all the way back again to Genesis, that went south real fast. And so God took the responsibility. I often wonder, why didn't God just zap it all out and start over again? Haven't you? Why didn't God just take his big eraser out and erase it and say, let's start over again? But that's what makes God God and us us. That God had a bigger plan, so we don't understand all of that. But God took responsibility and still takes responsibility because he sent his son to undo what was done. John says that we love God not by what we do, not by what we say, but by what we do. And so the question then comes at how far are we willing to go to show the love of Christ? I still believe everyone is created in the image of God, don't you? I believe everyone has the same value before God, don't you? And I'm going to add this to it. And you never lose that value. Never. Because what happens is people do dumb things. People do terrible things. People do outlandish things. And people, yes, even do evil things. But that doesn't change their value to God. It changes how we relate to them. It changes how we may see them. But I'm telling you, it has not changed God one iota. That's what we struggle with, don't we? Because here's what James says in 2.15. I read it for you. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute, lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, God will feed you. Matter of fact, your, what is it called, EBT card will come in next month. Go down to the trustee. Go to, oh, go, you know, Salvation Army's got a food pantry over there and they can help you. That's not what James says. James didn't say point someplace else. He says the question comes down to what can you do? Now maybe you're in the same boat together. That maybe both of you can't do much. But at least you can pray for one another, can't you? You go this way and look for food. I'll go that way and look for food. And whoever finds food, yell first, right? Good idea. But James says you cannot just say go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet do not supply your brother or sister's need. He says if you don't, what good is that? Isn't James saying I'm my brother's keeper? I'm going to bring this to something to make us all uncomfortable now because we can talk platitudes all day long, can't we? And say, yeah, I do this and do that. But we've got to drill it down. Because God wants to redeem everybody. God wants us to help everybody. So when we think of those that we may run into, not necessarily on a daily basis, but from time to time, how would we or how do we respond to those who may be a murderer? To someone who may be a pedophile? Someone that might be a sex offender? Someone that might be homeless. Someone that might be an addict. Someone that might be mentally ill. And here's a good one. How about the Muslims that everyone seems to want to kill? The adulterer, the communist, 
the socialists, and so on. Don't they have value before God? We look at what they've done, and of course we should kind of take a step back and go, oh, you shouldn't have done that. But you know, they are still loved by God. They are still in need from God. And so oftentimes people say they have forfeited any consideration because of what they've done, but you can't read that in Jesus' gospel. You can't. It's awful quiet in here now. If we don't answer with the resounding yes, that they are children of God and of great value to God, we're really not following the words of our Lord and Savior. We're not. We cannot qualify our answer. I know that's difficult. It should be, though. But when we look at the scripture, we find that Jesus physically touched the leper, the blind, the demonic, the unclean, and every category of person that was rejected. He did it on purpose. Everyone that the Jew may have thrown under the bus, Jesus reached out to. Everyone and anyone who we would not associate with, or even one in our church worshiping beside us, falls under Luke 6 and 27 but I say unto you listen love your enemies do good to those who hate you bless those who curse you pray for those who abuse you doesn't that encapsulate all the above that I've mentioned you know it pains me to see on Facebook and I have Christian friends on Facebook it pains me when I see them post stuff about Muslims and other people in the Middle East and let's just send another missile up their backside. Ha, ha, ha. That bothers me. That bothers me. Because Christians shouldn't think that way. And I know what everyone likes to say about it, but you know, God doesn't see it that way. Does not Jesus say, pray for your enemies? Doesn't Jesus say, Bless those that hate you. Pray for them. See, we're not letting it really get down to us yet. Because we try to make, we allow people to make excuses for it. And I'll give you this illustration. I would say this. Since when does the government have the right and the authority to tell me who to hate and to kill? No government has the authority to set aside God's commandments. And I'll say that, amen, all day long. No government can absolve you of any responsibility that you have before God. It doesn't happen. Am I getting any traction here, or are you ready to light some torches? The government cannot give anyone impunity for killing. The commandment says you will not kill, period. I know this flies in the face of America's manifest destiny and of American exceptionalism. But I believe Christians have been bamboozled, that's a good word, into thinking that killing in the name of freedom and God is somehow okay. It's not okay. It's not. I'm tired of it. Because you know behind killing comes famine. Behind killing comes all type of suffering for women and children and families. You know behind wars comes all types of terrible things that happens to people that really wanted nothing to do with it. People often point to the Old Testament to justify wars and so on, but you know, when we come to the New Testament in Christ, Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for them. You know what I have to take from that? I have to take from that because someone's going to say, yeah, but they're trying to kill you. Well, if Jesus says to pray for my enemies and love them, then he's taken upon himself the responsibility to protect me and to keep me and to help me. How about you? Finally, John says, this works us all over. Don't, don't think this doesn't work me over because it does as well. 1 John 4.20, those who say, I love God, and I love God, I don't know about you, but I love God, and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. Ooh. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, 
Those who love God must love everyone. Ooh. I have to admit, I got some work to do. How about you? I got some work to do. I understand that. I understand that. These scriptures cut me, and they should cut you as well. They just tell me that I have some more heavy-duty lifting with God to do, right? I've got to allow God in my life and in my mind and in my thoughts a whole lot more than what I have. And, of course, Jesus, in his final acts, extends his hand to everyone, including Judas, who was to betray him, to Pilate, who was to condemn him, and to those who said, away with him, crucify him, crucify him. And then we read, and we'll talk about it later as we move into Lent, that when we see on the cross Jesus nailed to it, crying out to his Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. <laughs> That's hard for me to imagine. How about you? It's hard. On the cross, Jesus looked down, not literally in a bad way, but he looked down upon those who were watching this scene unfold. And he told them, don't cry for me, cry for you. Cry for what's about to happen because of what's happening here. Jesus' attention in his last hours on the cross was to show his love to even those who despised him. Do you recall that when Peter cut off the servant of the high priest's ear, Jesus reached down and put it back on him and told Peter to put up the sword. Jesus, in his last acts, was trying to show us love and peace. And I know that's a hard lesson to learn today because it looks like we're in a world that has no peace. It's went mad. It went crazy. It appears that war has become just the way things are. It, be it becomes, or it seems that violence and even our own country seems to be the way that we take care of problems. If I can digress for just a minute, I know there was bullying when I was in school. But as far as I can remember, it wasn't that bad. Now it's epidemic. Now it's epidemic. There were some drugs in school when I was growing up. Wasn't too many too much. Now it's everywhere. We can go on and on with this. So I know the world we're living in. And this seems to be an odd prescription. But I have to believe that love conquers 